Hello everyone, my name is Chris Lamont and welcome to NYO Canada Online Workshops. Our YouTube live chat is open and we will be fielding questions at the end of the workshop. So please feel free to post any comments, questions, and of course, chat amongst each other as we go. Today, I am very excited to welcome back for the fourth workshop, uh, Paul Hyman. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Welcome everybody, good afternoon. So this is our last session with music with the brain in mind. And you can get the handouts. Uh, I understand you can download them. I put a really good package together for you. So feel free to, if you haven't done it already, to access those handouts after the presentation. So again, I always like to put this out to people to have a goal. Um, it's really setting a, an intention. What would you like to get out of this? What would you like to get out of a practice session, a rehearsal, an audition, a performance? Really set that intention of what would you like to get? It kind of focuses you. So our agenda today, I want to talk about repetitive strain injuries, hopefulness, the difference between practice versus performance, and your personal wellness plan that you can just keep adding to, adding to it, adding to it. Now, when we talk about repetitive strain injuries, is that really the mind-body connection? You've heard me mention a few times, if you're not aware, you can't take care. And then move differently, feel differently, feel differently, move differently. Now, when you think about it, I talked uh, last week about neurogenesis. Our new understanding of the neurosciences about the brain's plasticity, that we're constantly developing new wiring, new neural pathways. So as musicians, that's why we can do what we can do, because we're reinforcing over and over and over again, positioning techniques. And that's one of the things that's really great. However, you can also start wiring certain postural habits that may over time not be beneficial to you. So again, preventing repetitive strain injuries. I don't know if you know anybody, but there are hundreds of musical careers that have been cut short unnecessarily because of repetitive strain injuries. And I've been trained by the Workplace Health and Safety Agency of Ontario to be a trainer to teach people about musculoskeletal injuries. Just another name. Now, when we look at musculoskeletal injuries, what I want you to look at more is other names. So right in here, other names for MSI. So you've, I mentioned repetitive strain injuries, but to get a better understanding of this, I want you to see cumulative trauma disorder. It accumulates over time. So everything that you're using your body for is going to be affected. So if you're practicing and then you go and start working at the computer, again, you're working muscles that you may have used in playing your instrument, now you're accumulating that overuse that could lead to an injury, okay? So again, repetitive strain injuries, three things to look at. I want you to look at job demands. So it's posture, force, repetition. As musicians, we do a lot of repetition. A lot of times you're maybe forcing it a little bit because of nerves and obviously 
posture. So really, in all this research about repetitive strain injuries, there are medical treatments, as you can see here, but truly the only way that works is prevention. I've worked with people that have had a carpal tunnel issue, they've gone for surgery, and without that awareness, they have actually recreated another carpal tunnel problem and had to go for another operation. So you have to have that awareness and prevention. Now, when we look at uh, making some changes here, um, first of all, there is no perfect posture. As soon as you start, as they say, getting static and sitting in one position, certain things are going to start locking up on you. So I don't, I say fidgety, but you just need to keep moving yourself and shifting muscles on and off, off and on. Okay. The other thing too is musicians are athletes, right? We're using our bodies all the time. So no athlete is going to go out and perform without working out, without stretching muscles, without relaxing muscles. They do it, and all of us that play instruments need to do it. Every once in a while, take a moment and just catch a breath. So right now, everybody, take a nice breath of air in. And you can close your eyes and take another breath. And let that out. And then begin to open your eyes, refocus. But it's really having that momentary breath. Now, another thing about this breathing, and again with mindfulness training, the longer you exhale, the quicker you drop into the relaxation zone, the alpha state. So you can breathe in. And then a slow exhalation. Okay, and then checking your facial muscles keeps you looking young. Okay, some other things to look at is head position. So again, as you're sitting there, or maybe you're standing, I want you to see how your head is, okay? If you drop your head down, take a breath. Notice what that feels like. Lift your head up. So it's kind of like bouncing on the top of your head. Breathe. But sometimes I call it arriving before you get there. So get your head out and your neck back. And then take a breath. And you feel that restriction. Now, checking your shoulders throughout the day is a great place also to start. I call shoulders shitters. Like I should have done this, I should have done this, I should have done this. And this is pretty interesting because the 11th cranial nerve coming out of our brain is directly connected to our shoulders. It's a great way of monitoring our stress levels. And the fact is, is that when shoulders come on up, there's a principle with movement. You need stability before mobility, okay? So just drop your hands on your lap. Notice how it feels. Now, pretend you're in front of a computer or keyboard, bring up your hands or a piano and notice what your shoulders do. Drop it down and lift them up. You feel that little additional tension in your shoulder because you need that stability of the shoulders before you can have mobility with your fingers. Now, one of the things that I found out working with RSIs is that it doesn't happen down here when people say, I got a carpal tunnel issue. What really happens is it begins in the upper middle part of your back, that shoulder lock, that restricts the flow of circulation oxygenated blood to your working muscles and it also restricts the 
taking away lactic acid and other waste products from doing this work. So it's like really putting a kink in a garden hose. So what you really need to do is be aware of those shoulder tension, keep it shaking up, moving, and letting it drop, okay? And the other things is just, you know, recognizing some of the clothes you're wearing and how that's gonna affect you. So to make some changes, I'm gonna use the breath as a postural awareness piece. So I've had you take a nice deep breath of air in, and we're gonna do some Traeger Mentastics, and I'll explain that a little bit later, okay? So again, probably the first and only time we've ever breathed correctly is upon birth. And we need, it's pretty important, at least the first 60 seconds to catch that first breath of life. And when you watch a baby, they're breathing with their whole body. So when they breathe in, there's an extension in their spine, their arms go out on the in breath, and then roll back in on the out breath. And they're constantly moving their whole body with that breath. Okay, so they probably are our experts and specialists. Just watch them. Now, a couple things with breath awareness. If anything is not moving on a breath, it's stuck. So right now, everybody, I want you to be sitting there. Take a nice deep breath of air in. And notice. And then what I'd like you to do is get your head out and again breathe. And notice that restriction, okay? The other thing, too, is think of your head as a helium balloon. So as you're sitting there, imagine your hair head being picked up by your hair as if it's a balloon lifting to the ceiling or to the sky and have that lightness in your head aligning your spine and your neck. And again, taking another deep breath of air in. Now, I talked about shoulders. So here's another piece. Take your hands and just push down your hands as if you're pushing off a floor. Push down and now breathe, everybody. How does that feel? I'm sure it doesn't feel so pleasant. And again, getting your shoulders up around your ears, get them up like this, and now breathe. Now. You can start seeing how this combination works. Okay, so the head out like this, shoulders up like this, and breathe. Okay, you're getting getting the idea. Now, the lumbar region, your spine, okay? Our ribs are like Venetian blinds. As we breathe in, they're moving, kind of rolling, okay? It's cartilage attaching them to our sternum, to our back. But, you know, as performers, you're sitting there, you're performing to be alert and breathe. Now, I want you to be thinking about this. I'm going to sit down and I cross my legs, cross my arms, kind of slouching, I guess. Take a nice deep breath of air in, everybody. And notice how that feels. Now, I got to tell you. You know, as a performer, I used to work in, you know, Pops concerts in a huge coliseum, 25,000 people. You would, if you're playing a solo, you'd see yourself on this huge jumbotron screen, cameras on you. You're not exactly sitting like this, playing your horn. You'd be up, sitting, and you're ready for showtime. And then finally, the last thing is our hands. Okay, so take another deep breath of air in. And notice how that feels. Now, tighten your hands into fists and breathe. Do you feel that restriction? So you can imagine the combination head out, shoulders up, slouching back, tight hands, and breathe. <laughs> So one of the things I want you to be aware of is spiritus 
is Latin for the breath. So when you get inspired, it's like your whole body takes in that breath. Every cell of your body is rejuvenated. On a full breath of air, it usually takes about three minutes for all of that oxygenated blood to pass through your system. So when we look at movement as musicians, I just want you to see just the beauty of this acrobat in slow motion strobe lights and the incredible beauty of the human body in motion, the legs, just, just perfect. And as musicians, we're working over and over and over again to develop that same rhythmical reinforced muscle memory. Now, Traeger, he was a, an American physician who worked, oh, for 60 years doing this work of his movement re-education. And this was his philosophy. This was way before we know about neuroplasticity now. But he said there was no such thing as a tight muscle, but a tight holding pattern in the brain. So those kind of emotions, tension, stress that you feel up here can go directly into your body and start causing you to hold it and get rigid. So again, this quote from Dr. Milton Traeger, not until we experience it is it more than words. After we experience it, we don't need words. I'd like you to be thinking about this as performers. How many of you can relate to that incredible state of being in flow? You're not thinking, you're playing, it sounds wonderful. You've all experienced that? And then as soon as we start saying, wow, does that ever sound great? We drop out of flow. Now we're consciously thinking, okay, what do I have to do now? Blah, blah, blah. But in that beautiful state of flow, I don't think we really have words for it other than, yeah, flow. I'm in flow. Now, so some of the principles is to release different holding patterns tension, okay, and I like you to think of this being attempt, attention to tension, always tune in and have that awareness, attention to tension, and what we want to do is re-educate the muscles, make them softer, and release some of these holding patterns that may over time lead to a possible musculoskeletal injury. And we're always looking at new ways of moving. And I love uh, Traeger because I call it personally, as a practitioner, the jazz of body work. It's, it's completely improvised. So you have Traeger principles, a jazz musician has chord progression changes, and then it's completely up to a jazz musician to improvise in the moment. And that's why I really, really like Traeger, because it just gives a sense of freedom and flow and creativity. So again, Mentastics is part of Traeger. Traeger does have a component working on the massage table. But then afterwards, you give clients these self-care movements and Dr. Traeger coined the phrase mental gymnastics and called it mentastics. So basically you're recreating the experience you would receive from somebody like myself giving you a session. And then these movements are ways to recreate it on your own. So you're deepening, deepening, deepening that experience. And I like to also say Traeger is mindfulness in motion. Now, I'm going to take you through a few things right now. Um, 
Traeger Mentastics. But well, first of all, in our inner ear, we have three semicircular canals. And they're like our vestibular system, our sense of balance. It's a, a level of what's up, what's forward, what's back, what's to one side, one side. And we're constantly using that as a gyroscope to recorrect our posture under the influence of gravity. And here it is right now in your ear. The same image here is down here. These are your three semicircular canals. And again, there's nerve fibers going off to the brain. And here's one with your vestibular system. Now, one of the things I'd like you to experience with this is they've done research at the University of Rochester with people with dementia. And what they have found is that the longer people with dementia rock, the calmer they become. The longer they rock, the longer they stay calm. So what I'm gonna take you through right now may take you into a little bit of a trance, which is wonderful. And you can do this anytime, especially if you're prone to neck tension, shoulder tension, we're going to do this, everyone. So, first of all, I'd like you to be sitting, everyone. And as you're sitting in your chair, be aware of your sits bones. Those two little bony protrusions that you feel pushing down into the seat of the chair. I'd like you to kind of rock back and forth and feel your tailbone. So it's, again, a three-point stance. I want you to pull in your belly towards your back and feel that sort of lengthening to your spine. And now, again, imagine your head as a helium balloon. And I want you now just to begin doing this little rotation as you're sitting there in one direction and change to the other direction. Very, very gentle hula hoop and breathing and get even smaller going from side to side until it diminishes to just a sensation. Everything is connected. So now put your attention on your feet, flat on the floor, your right foot, your left foot. And starting with the right foot, be aware of your big toe, little toe, kind of side to side. You may find yourself rocking. Be aware of your little toe to heel, outer arch, forward and backwards. Be aware of your big toe to heel, inner arch, forward and backwards. So you feel yourself rocking a little bit. And you're pushing off the ground. Now your left foot. Feel the big toe, little toe connection side to side. Feel your little toe to heel, outer arch. Feel your big toe to heel, your inner arch. So there's a three-point stance. So what I'd like you to do now, everybody, is to initiate that rotation, pushing down on the floor and allow that pushing down to travel up through your leg, breathing, change direction. Now push down on your right foot and feel how that just alters your body posture over to one side and release. Push down on your left foot and feel how that alters your body posture to the other side. So as you're sitting there practicing or performing, 
you can settle into this position without anybody knowing what you're doing. So just feel that. Take a pause, everybody, and breathe. And just notice. Again, it's so beneficial to give yourself permission to just stop everything and breathe. So now we're going to do a couple movements with our neck. So the first one is a figure eight. So if you, you know, before we start doing this, I want you to imagine that your nose is a pencil. So just imagine your nose is a pencil. You've got that helium balloon lifting you up. You can feel that opening space in your neck. And now with your nose, I want you to trace the roundest, most fluid, easy, gentle number eight. Notice what direction you're going in and change direction the other way. Great. Now, we're going to do a number eight line on its side or an infinity sign and just up and over again initiating this movement with your nose and if you pay attention you may notice how it's even going further down your spine moving your sits bones as you're seated on the chair Change direction, go the other way. Now, you might hear a few little Rice Krispies, snap, crackle, and pop. That's okay. Um, if you hear a bang, you might want to stop. Now we come back to that number eight, top to bottom again. Easy, fluid, flowing, changing direction. And again, as you're doing that, if you feel any glitches, any tightness in any area, slow it down, breathe, and ask your unconscious mind, how could this be easier? How could this be softer? How could this be with less effort? It's an open-ended question to open up curiosity and exploration. Now we go from side to side again. Change direction. And that. One more time, top to bottom. And this is in your handouts, everyone, these instructions. And then finally, going from side to side. And just feel it all the way down. Your sits bones, how you're sitting in the chair, all the way down to your feet, as you've got this wobbly bobble head. Now, if you like, everyone, just close your eyes. Find that perfect positioning to your head and begin tracing number eight, not having your eyes closed, just feeling and change direction the other way. And then going from side to side, the infinity sign in one direction and then change direction. Now, as I said, we're wanting to change habitual movement patterns. So start top to bottom, change direction, side to side, change direction, top to bottom, side to side, change direction, top to bottom, 
That's right. Just keep going back and forth, playing with it, with a sense of curiosity. And just keep going back and forth. And you can make big movements, but gradually getting smaller and smaller, going up and down, side to side, until eventually you come to a stillness with only the sensation of that movement. And notice how that feels. And breathe. You're doing a huge amount of stimulation to that inner ear, those three semicircular canals. And it's an incredible way that you can do this any place. Just to calm yourself down. Okay. We're going to go into some Traeger swings right now. Arm swings. And again, this is in your handouts. So what I'd like you to do right now is maybe stand up. I'm just going to say seated. But when you're standing up, I want you just to have your arms hanging down by your side. Okay? And I want you just to get one shoulder up and down. Get your other shoulder up and down. Get both your shoulders up and down. And just feel the weight of your arms just dropping. And stop and breathe. And then you can start doing little rotations with your shoulders in one direction. Nice and soft and fluid. Change the other direction. And just take a moment and breathe. Let your arms just hang there. And what you might want to tune into is just feel the weight of your hand. Your arm hand is like a coat hanger just hanging off and just let it drop. So feel that weight and notice what it feels like just to let it drop in your lap. Now, the first one is I want you just to swing your arms and just gently allow those arms to go wrap around your body. Nice and easy looking straight ahead. I like to say, pretend your arms are like overcooked pasta. Wah, notice. Wiggling around, just flowing. Now, as you go a little bit further, make those arm swings even larger. So they're just wrapping around your body again, like overcooked pasta. And then as you do that, start adding your hips. So instead of just straight ahead, as you swing in the arms a little bit larger, allow your hips to swing with your arms. And just feel the way of your arms, your hands, just wrapping around your body, that gentle little twist in your hips, and maybe you're feeling it all the way down to your feet. And then finally, I want you to start swinging and allowing your head just to go along with the ride and just let it just fluidly flow as you swing your arms. So those are four variations of your shoulder swings. And if you are standing up, one more time, get your shoulders up like this. Now attempt to swing your arms. So you probably realize they don't swing so easily. So if you ever want to know if you got shoulder tension, shake it up a little bit 
and just begin this really soft, easy Traeger swing. So those are a couple of movements, and you can play with all kinds. I mean, I love this. Just like you're tracing your arms up to create the shape of a heart. Or you can take your hand. Great if you're using this to play your instrument. And you can rotate it in one direction, go the other way, go together. Or just pretend you have little water droplets on your fingertips. And you're kind of just shaking it up. Or you round and round and round. And just, again, drop them down. And you might feel a tingle in your hands. You're opening up new circulation. It's wonderful. So those are a few little exercises. Now, the next part of this presentation, I want to talk about the science of hopefulness. Okay? So we all, as musicians, as performers, hope that we can go further and further and further and maybe actually as a as a as a profession i'm sure you all maybe had dreams hoping one day to be in nyo so they're long term and that's one of the things is, as musicians it takes time as a bass trombone player i remember Believe it or not, years would go by, and you get that American Federation of Musicians newspaper, and one year after another, there was no openings for bass trombone in any orchestra in North America. However, I kept practicing and playing and doing all kinds of things believing one day there'll be a place for me to go and play. Now, we talked a couple of webinars ago, I think it was webinar two, about right and left brain processing. So you're also working as you're learning, integrating both left and right hemispheres. One is, remember, I see the forest, but I don't see the trees. I see the trees, but not the forest. So we're just playing with all kinds of details. We start working with our memory system that we want to ingrain. Oh, that works. And we learn from that. We embed it in our memory. It's our, um, as I said, our operating system from a couple of weeks ago. And here's another thing. Attention to details. Delayed gratification it's amazing as musicians how we develop that ability to have delayed gratification because it takes time to master our art our instruments and we can live with it with a sense of hopefulness that where we are right now is just absolutely perfect then we get into sequencing different stages of steps, learning more and more and more. And eventually we get into that mindset after you've got all of this together. I can do it. Go out and do it. So again, the value of hope. Well, it mobilizes all our resources. Okay. We believe we can do it, okay? And we work hard towards it. And what I want you to take from this is down here, we work with our circumstances, not against them. Yes, this is a different summer session of NYO. These are the circumstances we find ourselves in. And work with it. Do your very best to take in the very best that NYO is offering and work with those systems. One person I found inspirational was this Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl. 
And he was also a survivor of the Holocaust. And he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he wrote it in nine days. Now, that's his title that you can look up now, Man's Search for Meaning. But initially, he wrote a psychologist experience in a concentration camp. And he survived that with the hope that he worked under the circumstances. He never let that hope go where other people just gave up. So hope is huge. Now, it might be the most essential ingredient in your ability right now, everyone, is hope for positive expectancy. It helps your brain chemistry. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And we already have enough negative things going on. We want to look at what's something that's hopeful right now and in the future. And as I like to share with you that Japanese proverb, fall down seven times, get up eight. Now, hope is really powerful because instead of just going through the motions and just doing, 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 you become fully engaged in the process. And the truth of it is, is you go through your career and eventually become a professional you're going to be your own best teacher. Right now, you've got a huge faculty at NYO. They have all kinds of ideas for you to learn from, for you to participate. But eventually, you're going to be the one that's going to have to figure out how you're going to prepare and play a performance. So you're going to be your own best teacher. So how we feel is what we think. Okay? It's a two-way feedback system feedback forward feedback back so again i was talking about emotions and there was a or there is a molecular biologist candace pert who wrote a book on molecules of emotions and how we feel and the hopefulness creates an incredible amount of neuropeptides and those wire our brain so we want to have molecules of emotion and as positive as they can become we wire our brain more effectively with many more neural pathways than if we are in the negative state okay so here's an example that if you're feeling really good yeah, you fire those good feelings into your system. You can all think of things that you have done or experienced that have been really good, that are meaningful, and they're there. Fire or wire it into your brain. When it's not so pleasant, and you're saying no or that's wrong, you suppress those neuropeptides and you don't develop the same wiring in your brain so just look on the bright side of things and um the last little bit this is maybe for the faculty maybe for yourself if you are out there teaching students or they're going to be teaching you what do you think about how does it sound I love how you did that. Where'd you come up with that idea? It's amazing. I've seen kids like you before. You got a gift and it's awesome. Or, well, I know you haven't done well, but you know, I'm here on your side as I am right now. And I know you can get where you want to go. Just Hang in there. So looking on the positive. Now, we have focus of intention. I like to think energy follows intention. So having that focus, where do you want to go? 
in your life. Okay. Now we're going to look at practice versus performance. Okay. So here's some dynamics of performance. And I have this little model here that when you go out and perform, your colleagues see you like this, the audience sees you like this. But before you got there, you had to go inwards and look at that piece from so many different angles and coming up with a way that eventually brings you back whole, ready to perform. But you've gone deeper within yourself. Now, I've got a couple things here for you. So the first one is the how-to, your instrument, body mechanics that we've talked about. Then you've got music theory and history, you know? What was the period that this piece was written in? What was going on? What's the style that you want to create? Then your interpretation. And it might be, what was the composer wanting to express, bring out? What do you want to express? Because ultimately, it comes down to your performance skills, the art of delivery, to take all of that and put it out there and to touch people, emotions, make it magical. So all of this is all interconnected there. Okay. So here's another piece, the zone. You might have heard this before. How do you get into that performance zone? Again, you're looking at how do you drop in in 10 seconds or less? Okay. And you can work on it. It's unrealistic to think that you're always going to be at your peak best. But sometimes good now is better than perfect in the future. And there is something going on in corporations now called imposter syndrome. High level corporate executives that actually start to self doubt themselves because they feel everybody's going to know that they're a fake. I mean, they've done wonderful things, but they're a fake. And I know I've gone through it. I know a lot of my colleagues have gone through it because in the arts, we're attempting to reach perfection in an imperfect medium. There's always something more than we can do. And one of my teachers, Mr. Chris Foley from the Chicago Symphony, Northwestern University, even when he retired, he said, there is so, there is so much more I can learn about playing the trombone. So performers questions, pretty quick. You go in. What do I want to get out of this? What do I want to learn? And then afterwards, rather than be too critical, what did I learn? Again, your goals. So if you go into a situation of performance with a learning expectation, intention, usually you have a little bit more fun and you feel better. If you go in only thinking about that perfect performance, you may find it not as good and maybe disappointing so hold on to the bigger picture um, one performance is just one of many so if you think about improving in the tapestry of your life one percent over a hundred performances think about where you'd be so we talk about the performance bubble it's a way of really dropping into your zone in 10 seconds. And I've got this little guy here. Balance. Right? Okay. How many of you have heard such incredible performances where the performer has just been on the cutting edge? So that drive to the cutting edge is also very close to the proximity of total disaster. But it's right there. 
and it is so exciting. People can hear that, and they appreciate that. So, again, as we're looking at this, um, manage your performing state that you can be ready for anything at any time. The most unexpected things can happen. As I have this little ball here, and I'll do it one more time, it changes. Now, a good friend of mine, my best friend, Gordon Sweeney, and I have his permission to share this story with you. Um, he was nine years principal trombone in Dallas, 38 years with the uh, Toronto Symphony. He was uh, playing Mahler's Third Symphony, and there's a huge trombone solo. And just as he's ready to begin his solo, a door opens up in the balcony. He looks, you know, there's a light there. And this pregnant woman throws up outside the door just as he was about to play the solo. And it's one of the best recordings I've ever heard. But that's what happened at the last second as he went to play Mahler third. Okay. So overview, you want to practice dropping into your space. I say if you practice it, practice it. Use the techniques I've taught you. You can get there in 10 seconds. So what does it feel like? Maybe there's no words. Just drop in and practice your performance space. So again, this mind-body loop, this, this is in your handouts. But to have what you've never had, do what you've never done. So again, Alice in Wonderland, you know, you want to know where you're going. Because there's hundreds of other careers that are probably easier than attempting to be a professional performer musician. It takes dedication, a desire. So when we look at performance and the differences, this is all in your handouts, okay? And again, um, performing, you have one chance and this is it. I'll just share a little story uh, for the sake of time. When I got a job in Hong Kong, it was um, about two weeks before the beginning of the season. And they were supposed to, well, supposed to send me my plane tickets. And they had to deal with Air France. And rather than going across the Pacific, which I thought Toronto was basically on the other side of the world from Hong Kong, they flew me across Europe. And there's a whole story, but things didn't go well with the performance of the plane. It took me almost two and a half days or three days to get there. Long trip. <clears throat> I'm getting there late. And the piece we're playing is Cesar Franck Symphony in D minor, and it has a huge bass trombone position uh, part in it. And it's a, one part is a screaming solo with the principal trumpet. Anyways, the orchestra has done a couple days of uh, uh, practicing, and they're wondering, where's the bass trombone player? Anyways, I show up in Hong Kong that evening. I go to work the next day, jet lag, you can't believe. And in that first year, the conductor, his first year, hired 35 American musicians that already had jobs in other American orchestras. And he just made a deal that they couldn't resist paid them lots of money. Well, we all got paid coming over from overseas. They're all sitting there, and I'm the youngest guy in the orchestra, sitting down, having to play this one rehearsal, and this is the only chance I got. And, yeah, I got through it, but it was crazy. And in that preparation, you don't remember this, but the cassette tapes, I had a little tiny cassette player I had got one of the best recordings of the Caesar Franck Symphony D minor. I would pop in the tape, go into the plane's washroom with my mouthpiece, and buzz through 
looking at the piece. That's kind of what I had to do to get through this. So again, now is the moment. Okay, the music is constantly playing. You don't have time to let yourself get unfocused. So what you're looking at is just stay in the game. And I'll share this with you because to this day, one of my memories has been uh, Richard Strauss, Ein, Ein Heldenleben, again, a big bass trombone part. And there's one lick, well, that I had worked on and it pops up to a high G. I nailed it. It was, it just rang in the concert hall. And then I resolve it to a middle C, which is about the second note you learn on the trombone, and I split it so bad you could hear it crack off the back wall. That, it was in 3-4, so I hit it. I got one, two, next bar, one, two, three, and I have to play the same lick all over again. Only this time, I nailed it. I played the rest of the show, got great compliments from my colleagues, but I couldn't let go of that one middle C that I split. So, well, that's just the way it goes. So, again, you don't really need to um, look at this, but, again, when you are practicing, it's really nice to record yourself uh, just so that you have that ability to play it back. And if you can sit back and enjoy it, it's wonderful. And then you say, oh, that's me playing. So finally, cancel that self-talk. Just say, I can do it and get on with it. So again, when we're looking at performance, the longer you can practice, give some space, practice again. So for myself, I would look at the season schedule, see what I had to do and already prepare myself. Well, that's coming up in a couple months. So I started to kind of get into the mindset of practicing. So again, if you practice, or when you practice, you get better. When you get better, you have more fun. When you have more fun, you want to practice more. It's a cyclical cycle. So just kind of wrapping it up. Um, so make this part of your life experience. Communication, to have somebody to talk to, especially now is really important. You have something in your sheet that looks like this, my wellness support system. And the one thing that I want you to be aware of is your foul weather friend. Who can you talk to at three o'clock in the morning, 24 seven? to have that available. So your wellness program, we'll go through this quickly. These are different components of your wellness plan. You have something in your hand as to fill out. So you have physical ways to keep your body going. You got ways to manage your emotions. You've got social connections, involvement. You've got peer support. And you've got mental ways to stimulate your brain. And sometimes it all happens all at once, such as, you know, spiritual is that spirit is the breath. So you can go into nature. And if you would uh, indulge me for a second, music can cover it all. And as you can see, a trombone player. Now, just in closing, you've got this take the first step use some of the techniques that you have in your handouts over the last four webinars a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step song Tzu. and as we look at it you all have this in your handout so these are all the techniques i've shared with you taught you and it's like this it's like a little road trick i'm going to show you so when you feel yourself getting wound up and tight into a knot that's getting tighter and tighter and tighter, and you're aware of it, using these tools and techniques will easily and effortlessly release it and bring you back to balance. In closing, there's a little reading here. There's a chart here. Check off. 
another reading by uh, Napoleon Hill, whatever your mind can believe in, you can achieve. So in closing, hatch your inner potential. I can do it. And with that in mind, I have this little penguin that might have been the first of our webinars. And I trust that there has been a transformation, your awareness of music and the brain and mind, and you're all wiser for it. So thank you. If you have any evaluations or feedback, I'd appreciate it. That ends my segment of contributing to your summer with NYO. It has been my honor to be here. It has been a very important part of my life to be part of NYO. It will be part of your life. I'm Paul Hyman with Brain Fitness. Thank you. Wow, Paul, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll give it a few seconds to see if we have any uh, questions or comments coming through. I was trusting I was going to finish a little bit early, everyone. Um, but I really wanted to share this material with you because with the four webinars, you do have a really great package of information and techniques that you can use over the rest of the summer next year. And I would say probably use for the rest of your careers in life be it as a performer or just living life. That's great, Paul. I, I think maybe we'll call it there. Um, yeah, I really want to thank you uh, for being here with us over the past four weeks. Um, it's really been very, very uh, informative and insightful. And, and I really appreciated that. Uh, you know, that talk of, of hope and hopefulness. Um, I think in music and life, both those things, um, it was really meaningful. And, and I look towards practicing that myself. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Chris. It's been a great pleasure. Great. Well, take care. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye now.